All right, thank you for coming. Uh, let's talk about unit tests. Uh, how many of you write unit tests? Fantastic. And how many of you run your test suite before you check in? Fantastic. Perfect. So this will feel familiar. That's exactly where we're starting. So we're going to run our tests. We've just made some changes, pretty simple change, and uh, we get this. This is unfortunately far too familiar for a lot of us. We have failures. And these are our failures. Uh, don't worry about a lot of text on the slide. We're going to dig into this a lot. You don't need to read it all right now. But what we have here is uh, two failures, one for a statement method, uh, one for an HTML statement method, both in the customer test class. We don't even have time to dig into the HTML statement failure, but we're going to dig into the statement failure. So the problem here is we're in a terrible, terrible position. We have code that we just want to check in. We ran the tests that we thought were relevant to our code. And we have two failures. We have no idea why. We thought we'd done everything right. And we have no choices. I mean, really, our choices are fix this problem or go to lunch. We really can't do anything else. This is Bob. Bob has bad tests. The problem is that Bob is our teammate and also a friend of ours. Bob's a good guy. He wants to write good tests. He wants everybody on the team to be happy. He wants to write maintainable code, not just domain code, but testing code. Uh, he's trying to help everybody out, wants to do the right thing. Everything's great, except he doesn't write maintainable tests. He writes terrible tests. Bob left you this failing test. This is the statement method. This test isn't very long. I don't know, half a dozen lines of code. And yet, there's way too much going on here. Specifically, Bob decided we need a loop in our tests. How many of you use loops in your tests? Come on, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> So Bob, Bob also likes loops in his tests. Uh, and we need, to figure out, we need to figure out what's wrong with this test. So we need to figure out what terminates this loop. Pretty simple. Length. But, but what's customers? Nowhere in the slide can you find what customers is. If this is your screen, nowhere on your screen can you find, find what customers is. Uh, if you're lucky, you're working with an IDE that helps you get there. But, but just think about that for a minute. You need an IDE to help you get there for the first line of code for a failing test that you didn't write. It's not a great situation. That's OK, because we have an ID. So we go to the definition, and it brings us here. Customer test class, not a big deal. We have some fields, customers. Great, fantastic answer, right? It's just, just a Java array of customer instances. I mean, what's the problem? The problem is we still don't know what's going on with these customers. So we have to uh, go or use the ID again to bring us here. And now we have this magic setup method that we're all familiar with. This, this template method pattern that magically made it into our X unit framework and never went away. So find usages brings us here. We don't even have time, again, to dig into something, the object mother for this. Let's just assume that by some magic, we already uh, know exactly what's going on with our object mother. And yay, we have customers. It took us all of those steps just to read not even the whole first line of code. That's not great. So back to the failing test. We're looping through some customer instances. And we have, you know, what's the next thing you look at? When you look at a test, you look at, you look at the expected value. That should be pretty easy to figure out, except it's not. Instead, we have an expected value uh, that's returned from a method call. So we have to look at the arguments. Step one, figure out what the arguments are. Uh, in this case, as we all know, we need to look to the last argument. Rental info, again, should be straightforward, except it's not, because we have to go to another definition. And rental info is a helper method that takes strings and rentals and returns a string. <laughs> Finally, we get to something that we can understand. It took three minutes and 45 seconds to get to anything reasonable, for some value of reasonable. Uh, never mind the law of Demeter violation, which we would all, of course, change, except we're three minutes and 55 seconds into just trying to check in. So we, present, we pretend that this problem is not there, and we continue on. Rental info loops over the rentals and returns a string describing the rental. It's straightforward enough, I guess. Back to uh, the statement method and what's next. Well, we have to figure out what the next argument is. It's a customer. We have no idea what customer. We know we have four customers. We don't know which one is causing the problem. In fact, we have no way to figure out what our failing test is without a print statement or running our test in debug and putting a, a breakpoint in there. 
So this is not exactly a great test. We have a problem and we can't, can't even look at the test and figure out what's going on without writing some type of code. Finally, something simple. Some type of string literal, even though it's being passed to another method. Uh, but, but at least it's not something we have to use the IDE to understand. So we take all of those things and we go to the expect statement. And what does it do? Not much at all. It does not deserve its own method. But somebody aggressively applied dry, Bob, as we know. Bob thinks dry always applies. And so Bob applied dry and has this expect statement. And uh, all we're really doing is a string.format in here. It's not worthy of its own method. So if we're going to fix this test, this is what we have to work with. We're forced to digest all of this code. We're forced to look through stuff for about five minutes. And I'm familiar with it, so I'm going a little fast. Imagine you were having to go through all of this code, all the code that's on the screen, because you made a change in the movie domain object. Think about that. The movie domain object, which you haven't seen. The movie test, which you haven't seen, because you're in customer. You made a change in movie, you added a new feature, everything's great, and you have failures in some other tests that you've spent far too much time looking into. I think this is a bit of a problem. I don't really call that maintainable. So what all would I say about this code so far? I would say that it follows common testing patterns. I think there's probably a lot of people in here that are like, yeah, OK, sure. Looks about pretty standard. Uh, there's probably some people that find this code not too impressive. Uh, but at the same time, it's just kind of the standard, isn't it? This is, this is what unit tests look like these days. People use setup because it's there and they don't know any better. People use object mother because it, it's a pattern that's established and they don't know of a better alternative. And people use dry because dry is like the golden rule of programming. If you do nothing else, don't repeat those characters. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's a really great way to test, but, but that's kind of where we're at. Uh, where I think it fails and where I think we should spend a lot more of our time is we can't understand any of this quickly. All we want to do is check in. We really shouldn't have to go through all of this trouble to just check in our code. So let's, let's review all, again what all we looked at. We had to find the statement test. We had to find the definition of the customer's array that we're iterating. We had to find the assignment to customers. We had to digest, set up the assignment of each customer and their associated name. We had to find the object mother class, which we skipped because we don't even have time. Uh, we determine how the customer instances are created. Then we have to digest each of the different customer instance creation methods within the object mother. At this point, we understand the first line of the test. Then we digest the expected value that's being created by calling a method with a string, a customer, and the result of calling rental info with two string instances and customer rentals. Find the rental info method and determine the value. It's returning to expect statement. Digest rental info is creating a string by iterating and formatting rental data. And now you've mentally resolved the args to expect statement. You find the method and digest it. And at this point, it's taken you 10 steps to simply understand the expected value of your test. Not one character that you have digested will ever run in production. You have provided no value to your customer uh, or to your business or whoever you wrote the code for other than mm, preventing regression. I mean, at least these tests told us that something changed and something needed to be looked at. But other than that, no value. No customer will ever use any of this code that you've just looked through. And it's practically impossible, as I said, to fix this problem without putting a breakpoint in or uh, putting some type of print line in. So this is bad. This is the state of the world. This is the average state of the world right now. And we just go about writing these tests and, and not really asking ourselves, why are we doing this? Why are we applying these patterns that do work very well in, in our domain models? Uh, why are we applying them to tests blindly without asking ourselves, is there a better way to write these tests? Uh, is there a different way to code that will actually create more maintainable tests? We write tests we don't need with time we don't have to satisfy people we don't like. What if we took a step back? I do believe there's a better way. I do believe that we can write really nice tests. Uh, I hope we've begun to realize that things have gone wrong, really. Looking through these tests, things have obviously gone wrong. It's time to look at unit testing with a fresh point of view. Josh Graham succinctly provided what I believe is the best high-level goal for unit testing. You can have your own high-level goal. But this is my high-level goal. Uh, this is what I like to think of. To create a tiny universe where software exists to do one thing and do it well. 
One thing and universe are the most important pieces here. I want my test to focus on a single thing, have a single responsibility, if you will. And I want a tiny universe. I don't need four customers if I'm testing one customer. I need one customer. So before we even get into how, what changes we could wi make, we need to think about motivators. What motivates us to write tests in the first place? There are probably a lot of motivators. Uh, I would say these are pretty reasonable motivators. These are the motivators that I think would, would drive Bob, if Bob and I are working together, to write some tests. So let's say that Bob uses these motivators to write his tests. How do we feel like Bob's doing, given these motivators? I would say Bob's actually doing pretty well with enabling refactoring. I have a failing test. That means I can refactor. I have some confidence. Fantastic. Immediate feedback. Yeah, works well enough. Run the test suite. I see things are broken. Fantastic. Bob has no idea how to, make, how to break this problem up into smaller pieces. Bob gave me four customers that have nothing to do with each other. They're all on the same test, but they don't interact with each other in any way whatsoever. There's really no reason they need to be together, except Bob wanted to consolidate characters. Bob blindly applied dry. So again, there's a better way. Dry, don't repeat yourself. Hopefully everybody knows that. It's widely accepted as the golden rule of programming, or at least that's what I like to call it, probably when I'm putting it down. Uh, but it doesn't apply. Not all the time. I think it applies contextually, not dogmatically. The tests we looked at are dry. I don't think anyone can argue that. The tests are dry. We, we used a loop and helper methods. We re repeated as few characters as possible. But we never stopped to ask if that application of dry would help future maintainers. Does anybody here feel like the, the application of dry helped them understand this test? Of course not. But the way Bob wrote this test is he wrote maybe four tests to start with, and then he put the whole thing in a loop because he applied dry. And he didn't really think about future maintainers. He just thought, look how dry my code is. Look how many characters I saved. Fantastic. That savings buys you nothing. Drying up your code like that just takes away from readability. So there are three, three levels at which you can apply dry. I mean, it's not all bad. It's not like we should just throw dry away. But think about how you're applying dry. Most people apply dry at the suite, fixture, and test levels. So specifically here, I'm talking about suite being global. Likely, if we're in Java, global static methods. That's, that's a pretty decent place. Fixture. Uh, fixture is the methods and fields of a test class. This is so common. So many people apply dry there, and I really don't understand why. Uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that in one second. Uh, but test. Test is a great place to apply dry. You don't want to repeat your stuff within the test method itself. But you do want to switch to this, I think. I would take that away from this talk. Uh, I'm here to strongly suggest that you change your approach. I recommend you apply dry at the suite level. That's fantastic. You want to create customers? Good. Use a customer builder. You want to create movies? Use a movie builder. You want to create rentals? Use a rental builder. Apply the builder pattern globally. And any domain object that you want to create within your tests, use that same builder. That's fantastic. Day one on the job, you look at the tests, and you say, oh, I need a customer. I'm using a customer builder. Interesting. Let me look at that. Day one, you look at the movie builder. At that point, you now know everybody's using builders to create domain objects. I know where my builders are defined. So now I can create anywhere in the whole test suite. I can create a customer or a rental or a movie. And it's all created the same way, shared knowledge. Same thing at a test level, obviously. That, that's great to remove dry, I mean, you don't, or to, to apply dry. You don't want duplication within the test. But the fixture really, the, everything you dry in a fixture can't be reused. That's the problem I have with it. It's, it's reused within the single class, but every time you open a test from that class, you're coming fresh. And you have no idea about these helper methods and, and what they're there for. Say you have 10 tests and several helper methods. Which helper methods go with which tests? I don't know, especially if one of them's set up and it's just magically used. Uh, and then, of course, the problem of everything that's created in setup is not used in every test. So we have a lot of problems with this, but it's a pretty simple answer. Just stop drying things at the fixture level. So specifically, testing diverse customers at the same time is a bad idea. Stop testing unrelated concepts. Uh, don't create unrelated data if you're not going to use it. Just create what you need. And don't extract methods for a, a single string return value or anything silly like that. There's, not, there's often not much value in extracting a method within a test because you're forcing, there's always conceptual overhead of going somewhere else, always, every single time. 
So think about it as if you were coming to that test fresh. Would you really want the conceptual overhead just to reduce a couple more characters? So we know of a few things that could be improved, but you know it's all a little abstract right now. We do have concrete examples of exactly how we can get all of this done. So the first thing is simple. We're just going to replace the loop with individual tests. It's not that hard. Just break everything out. Break everything out into four tests. There are a lot more characters here, but you can read exactly what's going on per customer. Running these tests produces the following output. It's so much more clear than trying to understand what's going on with the loop. This is, instead of the single failure for the statement, this is three failures. And we can see that, let's see here, John has Godfather failing, and Steve does also, and Pat does also. How about that? We have a pattern that we couldn't see whenever we had a loop. Now we have some type of pattern that we can dig into and figure out what the problem is. So back here, we can see that, interesting, John has uh, Git Reynolds. So oh, we don't have that much info here either, do we? Uh, we don't know exactly what John has, um, but at least things are broken out so we know which tests are failing. And it's only after we've duplicated everything that we're free to dry anything. It's OK if the duplication bothers you at this point. We're tearing it all down. We're tearing the loop out of, out of our code. We're going to duplicate everything, and then we'll go back and look at what we can, can uh, dry up later on. But we'll do it at the suite level, not at the fixture level. So the next thing we're going to do is expect literals. Here's how the tests look now. We're still calling this helper function that really is not providing us any value other than some dogmatic application of dry. So why call a parameterized method once that does nothing more than return a string? You know what the best representation of a string is? A string literal, every single time. And that's what these tests give you, string literals for expected values, so there's no more looking around. These tests are significantly easier to, to digest. Uh, at this point, I'm pretty sure everybody knows exactly what's going on in these tests. And the final thing, the problem I brought up earlier, you still didn't know what, was, what those uh, three failing tests, what they were. What, what, what type of customer was that? Here, we have no idea what type of customer we have. We have Pat, and we have John, and we have Steve, but that's not really clear enough. But here, we put the object mother straight in line. We get rid of the setup method. And what we end up with are tests that are easy to read. So we know, uh, basically what we know is that the one on the top left works. I could, I could go back to the failing tests, but I won't waste your time. The one on the top left works, and everything else fails. And so it's pretty safe to say. Looking at the object mother def uh, static method definitions, we can see that if we have one, two, or sorry, one, one new release uh, or a new release and a regular, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly, we can see what's going on by reading the test. Isn't that kind of nice? What's even better is that we can delete the setup method and we can delete the customer fields. So we're deleting code and we're creating better tests. Setup is clever. That's fine. Bob's tests are very clever. OK. The problem is clever is less maintainable in this case. The aggressive application of dry made these tests harder to understand. That's a real problem for me. It's a real problem for me whenever my teammates are writing tests that are harder to understand. And it's even worse when I'm writing tests that's hard for my teammates to work with. I mean, it's a pretty surefire clue whenever somebody comes to you and says, I can't figure out exactly what's going on with your test. Can you come help me out? Chances are there's going to be some type of extraction. Because if your tests look like this, they shouldn't need your help. So you know what else is interesting about all this, in my opinion? I said that we were going to kind of expand everything out, and then we'd go back and look at drive. The thing is, even after we duplicated all this code, even after every change we made, the overall number of lines has barely changed. It hasn't changed. But people dry things so aggressively that they don't even look at the actual impact to the code. So I'm practicing this presentation in front of my wife, and she says, you're so angry. Can, can you just cheer up a little bit? And I said, I can't. These tests are killing me. Uh, how many people in here are consultants? So I, I did consulting for quite a while, and it, it would be very common to run into tests that look exactly like this. And it's so frustrating. You want to go in and provide business value. You, you want to help a customer. And uh, they have somebody on the client site who you can only gently say, there's a better way, you know, we, we can do better. 
and it, it just drove me crazy. It, it really did. It really kills your productivity. It kills the team's performance. Um, and there, there are so many rules that are applied dogmatically that really just don't apply to tests. A and we're only halfway there. The, there's still many more changes we can make. But first, we're just going to talk about motivators. Because people don't even take a step back and ask themselves, why are we even writing tests? I mean, there are a lot of great reasons to write tests, but chances are there's going to be, I don't know, six different things on my list, and not all six will apply to every person in here. In fact, the combinations, probably everybody in here will have three out of six that apply to them, and they'll be different. And that's okay. You just have to take a step back, though, and understand why you're writing the test in the first place, and then make your tests match what your motivators are. Specifically, I'm motivated to write tests whenever I want to validate the system, also known as getting feedback or preventing regression. This is pretty standard. Code coverage, very standard. Uh, for a while, code coverage uh, was a main motivator for writing tests. A lot of people believed in 100% code coverage. Uh, it used to be some consultancies would put that in their agreements. We promise to give you 100% code coverage. And then they realized what a terrible idea that was and stopped doing that. <laughs> Uh, but it's still out there. There's still tons of tests out there that were written just for code coverage purposes. Enabling refactoring, one of my favorite reasons to write tests. Pretty self-explanatory. Documenting the system, something I cannot relate to, something I've never done, but I've worked with some brilliant people who just love to document the system by writing tests. When they come to a new code base, the first thing they do is read a bunch of tests. It just doesn't work for me. It's so boring. It puts me to sleep. But, but people can use it, and so it's fantastic. If I worked on a team with three other people, and all of them preferred documenting the system via tests, uh, I would have more tests. You know? the, the test just has to have a positive return on investment. For me, a test that only serves to document the system doesn't help. I'm never going to go read it, more than likely. But if 75% of my team, 80% of my team will, that's a great motivator. Your manager told you to. I would not be surprised if there are people in here who hate unit tests. Frankly, the unit tests that I've seen, I hate them too sometimes. Uh, maybe you've given up on it. A lot of people have, and I don't blame you. Uh, and, and your manager tells you, you still have to write them anyways. Uh, now you're in a tricky position, right? You're not a believer. You think it's a complete waste of time, and your manager makes you do it. Uh, I'm sure that motivator applies to some people in here. Test-driven development, the most common motivator. I don't think there's much to say. Uh, also known as breaking up the problem or improved design. Uh, it's a great motivator for writing tests. While I was a consultant, I once had a customer who would only accept new features to the system when the unit test suite was green. The customer couldn't read the tests, had no idea what was going on in the tests. But if they were green, things were good. And if they were red, we weren't moving on. Uh, so that's an interesting motivator. I just suggest that everybody ask themselves what, what motivates their team. And what motivates you personally might not actually be the same as what motivates the team, and then you really have two choices. You should either conform or you should probably go, go find another team, honestly. Uh, you have to do what's right for the team. You write a test for you the first time you write a test, but if you leave a test that you wrote for you, you're doing a disservice to the team. You really have to think about what the team wants, what the team needs. Uh, and that's just as important for writing tests as it is for deleting tests. You have to maintain every line of code. If there's only one thing that you remember, please remember, any fool can write a test that helps them today. Good programmers write tests that help the entire team in the future. It's really not about you. It's about the team. So what else can we do? What else can we do not just to help ourselves, but to help our team? The first thing worth considering is this is your career, and it is ending one test suite run at a time. Who has a test suite? No, no one will answer this. Who has a test suite that runs in more than 10 minutes? There you go. Some brave people. Thank you. What do you do in those 10 minutes? Browse the web, Twitter, I don't know, look at emails. You're not working on code, and it's breaking up your flow, running that test suite for 10 minutes. And it's not really that hard to make things better. One simple rule, and your test suite will run a whole lot better. Never cross the boundaries. Don't go to the file system. Don't go to the network. Don't go to the database. That's it. Just don't do any of those things. Mock out those resources. I don't care if you use constructor injection, setter injection, or something magical. It doesn't matter to me how you do it. But just don't, don't do those things. And your test suite immediately will go up, I don't know, 100x, 1,000x. 
Now, does anybody in here have in-process computation as the bottleneck in their test suite running? That is very cool. You, you must work in a cool domain. <laughs> And the percentage is still great, right? The rest of you, all you have to do is don't go to the file system network or the database, and you're good. That simple change alone will help your team significantly. There's one other simple rule. It's, it's simple and straightforward, uh, but this is a little dense. The class under test should be the only concrete class found in a test. The last time I gave this presentation, somebody said, what do I mean by concrete? I mean the implementation. The actual implementation, any class with an implementation, if you can get away with it, should be the only class within that test. So movie class, movie test, customer class, customer test. If you can get away with it, no movies in your customer tests. For example, this test can be a bit of a problem. The tests you've seen thus far, including this one, are conflating string building, verification of summing points, verification of summing charges. Here we have a customer method, uh, test method, but the results depend both on rentals and on movies. So of course, any change to rental or movie can also cause this test to fail, even though we're in the customer test. We have an implicit or explicit dependency, depending upon how you look at it. The test on the right is the alternative. Rather than living with the implicit dependency, there's a really simple solution. All you need is a mock. Here we have a mock uh, that's really just behaving as a stub, which is pretty much how I always use my mocks, to be honest. And that's it. Now any change to the rental or any change to the movie that's even farther down will have no impact on this test. I mean, other than an API change, obviously. But no implementation within those classes will cause this test to break, which is a great thing. Quick side note, you might have noticed null. I'm sure half the people were offended, and the other half thought I made a mistake. Uh, null is just a magic string here, just like godfather over on the left is just a magic string here. If you have just an aversion to nulls, then sub the method. But me, I, I see no difference between those magic strings. So moving on, we have string concatenation now verified. Here we have simple tests that also verifies the total charge and the total points. You can introduce these tests that, that focus exclusively on summing. So now we have even smaller tests. We had what we thought looked like a pretty simple test. We thought maybe single responsibility because we're calling one method, but turns out not so much because that method was calling other methods. Here we just test them all in isolation and we mock things out or stub as I prefer and, and we have even smaller tests with even less responsibility. And we're now well covered. Fantastic, everything's great. Except we have you know, this null, and we have zero points, and that's a little bit interesting. So of course, we need another test, which is not really a big deal. I mean, this movie test is pretty straightforward. We have movies, and we specify the number of, or we specify the type, and then we specify the numbers in there are days, and we get a charge for the days. And again, straightforward tests. Coming to this test fresh, coming to this test when you want to check in, you should be able to understand what's going on extremely quickly which is great, that's the goal. You wanna be able to come to a test, see what's gone wrong, and change it as fast as you can. This is a great incremental step. These tests make life so much better for our team. We now have confidence in everything because it's all just as covered as it was before, so fantastic, we maintain that confidence. But we have isolation. We feel comfortable that changes to a given class will only create failures within the test for that class. Movie test changes, movie, or sorry, movie class changes, movie tests fail. Customers change, customer tests fail. But they're all isolated in a way using those stubs that the other uh, changes will not cause those tests to fail. No more cascading failures. One of the big reasons people hate unit tests. Okay, so things are much better. Uh, despite my happiness with unit tests, there's still another test that I would honestly write every single time. Uh, the tests now are, are very isolated and that's great, uh, but we're only working with mocks. We have no verification of integration, right? We have a gap in our testing that, that didn't exist before. And this is, of course, a problem that we should address. I mean, we, we don't want to find this gap in production. So we get here. This unit test brings everything together and ensures no integration surprises. And it feels very much like I've contradicted myself because now we have concrete classes. Uh, and what it really comes down to is that I have different tests for what I'm looking for, the type of feedback that I'm looking to get. So 
this isn't to confuse you. Instead, uh, I'd like to have my unit tests serve specific purposes. The tests that have a single concrete class are designed to test the code branches and logic. All of the tests that you saw before tested all of the branches. They tested the git charge for the movies with a specific number of days. They tested the, the string concatenation in isolation. But here we have one thing that brings it all together. So the tests that use stubs, I call them solitary tests. The steps that bring everything together, or the tests that bring everything together, like this, the integration tests, I call them sociable, because the classes talk to each other. And I break these things up. I actually have separate namespaces in Java projects, so all of the solitary tests live in one space, and all of the sociable tests live in another space. And that way, when one of them fails, I can look at the failure and say, all right, what exactly am I testing here? What, what am I worried about? If it's sociable, I'm only worried about integration. If I'm testing code branches or corner cases in my sociable tests, I'm doing the wrong thing. I, I have a missing test there. I have a clue that I have a missing solitary test. No problem, go write the solitary test. If the, if the failure is in the solitary test, then maybe I have an actual problem in my domain, or I just need to update the test. But I have tests, again, that are focusing on a single responsibility. So not only does the test only test one thing, but it's also a specific type of test that tells me where I need to go based on the feedback. And you separate them to make it easy for you to know where to go based on the feedback. How else can you improve things? There are a couple easy ways. This is the movie test that we all saw. If the second, if the second assertion fails, none of the code below it will run. I assume everybody knows that, but have you ever really thought about that? How valuable is that code? The code below the second assertion if it fails. I think the easy answer would be it's not valuable at all because it doesn't run. What, what value is there in code that doesn't run? But it's worse, really, if you think about it. There's no value in code that doesn't run, but it's still sitting there. You're still maintaining that code. When this test fails, you have to go look at the test, and you have to try to figure out what's going on. So you have not only a failing assertion, but you have noise below it, and you have no idea what's going on with that noise. If you have this failure, you don't know what's going on after it in any way whatsoever. All you know is that you had a charge for children's, and you expected 1.5, and you got 3.0. So we go back, and we can see that we're expecting 1.5 in several places. So we have to use the line number, basically, and we know everything below that line was worthless. So that's not great. I know of one failure. I have no automatically generated information about the remaining tests. Given a test with multiple assertions, when they're all passing, they all provide value. It's obvious, it's easy. But when it fails, all the value is removed from the subsequent assertions. And when faced with a failing test with multiple assertions, you're for forced to make one of two choices. Neither one of them are good, to be honest. One is read everything and guess if it's going to work next time. And none of us will do that, because we're lazy, as we should be. Instead, we will run the test, we will fix the assertion, and we will run the test, and we will fix the assertion. And we will run the test and fix the assertion over and over until everything works. Probably never even stopping to think, why am I wasting my time doing this? Because it's become natural to us. It's just what we do now. Or we could stop doing that. What if we ran the test once and we got all of the feedback at once? That would, that would be nice. And it doesn't sound so crazy, does it? But yet you talk to people and you say, how about one assertion per test? And they think you're insane. But this is what it looks like. This is the same test only two of the four, uh, because it's a slide. But suddenly our tests are easy, con easy to consume. Again, single responsibility. And so now we have a test suite run that whenever it runs, instead of seeing one failure and not knowing what else is going on, we see three failures. We see that the charge for a children's three-day is one, uh, expected 1.5 and got three. And for a four-day, we expected 3.0 and got 4.5. And for five, we expected 4.5 and got six. So it's just three failures. By breaking things up, instead of having one failure, we have three. But the sum of this is obviously better. It doesn't take a genius to understand that suddenly the pattern ha has come out that anything over two days is broken, but it's always off by 1.5. So now you can go to your domain and figure out what that entails. Did you, did you break the domain code, or did the business actually just say, yeah, that's the change that we want to make? But the sum of the errors is better, so why wouldn't you want that information? So the expected and return values give you valuable information per test. Uh, as I said, the sum is, is better than the parts. 
And every time you write multiple assertions, you're suppressing valuable information. Again, not just for you. More importantly, probably for your teammates that come here without context. So wrapping up a little bit, the second thing that I would like you to walk away remembering, if, if you're willing to give me two things to remember, is the test that you, the test that you own end up owning you. There are so many examples of this, uh, and I love all of them, so bear with me. Uh, imagine you're working for an insurance company, and you need to look people up by their social security number, or whatever unique identifier, it doesn't really matter. You want to validate that somehow. When somebody calls up and, and asks about their policy, you need to be able to pull up their file. But what if their name's J, and instead it was J-A-Y-1? I'm still going to be a customer. You're still going to look me up. Everything's still going to work out OK. The worst thing that happens is that maybe I get mail with my name on it, and it looks a little bit wrong. But that's it. So the tests that validate these things, the tests that validate the unique ID, they need to work, because you need to be able to look people up to run your business. But the test that verifies that my name is alpha is not necessary. Is it good to have? Sure, it's nice. Maybe. I mean, now there are names with alpha, so how great was that test, really? But maybe it's good to have, maybe it's not. Uh, in that case, it's probably easy to write the test, and you move on. But what about something like a web form? I want to put a red background whenever somebody puts a 1 in their first name. OK, simple logic and, and nice, right? But how are you going to unit test that? Selenium, some type of web runner that takes 5 minutes to execute, 10 minutes to execute? Is it? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth adding to your test suite to validate that the background went red? Can you still do business without a red background on your web page? I think you can. Another example that I don't think people consider is, is what I mentioned earlier, but, but this is the most common one. You, you want to write TDD. Fantastic. TDD is great. Uh, I'm all on board with TDD. But that just helps you design your code. It, it helps you create. I don't know, maintainable designs, and uh, it helps you drive towards the design you want, evolutionary design, so many great things, so many buzzwords. But once you're done, once you have that good design, that test is maybe not necessarily as valuable. Look at that test that you created for TDD and decide, is it going to help the team in the future? If it helped you get to the design you got to, that's great. It served its purpose. Nobody's going to tell you that you shouldn't write that test. But that doesn't mean you need to maintain that test forever. And your team needs to maintain that test forever. So look at a test and decide if it's worth it in the moment, but also if it'll continue to be worth maintaining. Stop thinking about tests from your individual point of view. Think about the team. I mean, that's, that's definitely the high-level takeaway from this presentation. Your tests are not special. They're not beautiful or unique snowflakes. They're the same decaying text as every other test. It's, it's all about your team. It's really not about you. It's about making the whole team more successful, and it's about thinking about the context that you're in and how you can help your team. That's it. Right, so there are some questions. Great. What is dry? Don't repeat yourself. Uh, it just means it means very different things to, to different people. I believe it originated in the Pragmatic Programmer. Uh, I'm sure it came before that book was released. Uh, and it basically just says, don't repeat the same concept. Some people interpret that as, don't repeat the same characters. Uh, I don't agree with that definition, but uh, it's, it's very common to find that. But uh, I would say the, the essence of it is just, don't repeat the same concept within your systems. OK, thank you. How do you mock final classes? Uh, find a better language. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> no, well, th I guess there's if if you're using some if you if you're using a final class that you you absolutely have to use, you could just wrap it a in a not final class and then and mock that. That's what I would do. What if irrelevant data helps us discover false negatives and false positives? Uh, as long as you have a motivator driving you to write a test, write it and write more of them. As long as it's providing value, that's great. But the takeaway should be, is this test providing value? Not, oh, I just need a test blindly. Why limit not drying aggressively to testing? Will these read readability improvements cause problems outside the tests? 
Can you repeat the second half again? Sorry. I didn't get it either. <laughs> <coughs> Will these readability improvements cause problems outside of tests? Uh, I assume the question is why limit it? Would it be better to duplicate also as well? Uh, I mean, that's a great question. For It's great to think about code that way. I can't possibly say don't dry your code. They'll throw me out of the community. Uh, <laughs> but, but thinking about the return on investment of every line of code is extremely valuable, not, not just for tests, obviously. Right, we have time for a few more. What's your take on naming? I miss descriptive test method names in your examples. <laughs> uh, I think if X unit had been created in a language that actually supported anonymous functions, then we wouldn't have had test names by default. Uh, I think they're great when they're great, and they're worse than bad in, in many occasions because they're wrong. Uh, the first version of this book had test names that were wrong because you write a test, well, you write the name first most of the time, and then you write the test, and the test either evolves right then, and you forget to change it, or somebody else evolves the test in the future. And as, as was said in the last presentation, uh, the famous quote, code doesn't lie, which is great and true, but comments do lie. And a test name is a comment. Don't kid yourselves. A test name is a comment. It is nothing else. Is BDD a viable way to improve maintainability of tests, or your thoughts on BDD in general? Uh, BDD is very opinionated, and if the team is on board, go for it, fantastic. And if the team is not on board, it's the worst idea. Maybe not the worst, but pretty terrible. Uh, it's all about buy-in. It's extremely opinionated. There are many opinionated test frameworks out there, uh, and none of them are the right answer. It's all about the team. I think this will be the last question. If you're doing single assertion per test, you would easily end up refactoring to dry. Should you copy the same setup for the multitude of assertions? Yes. Not in the setup method, within the test itself. Absolutely. The key is to have that tiny universe that's incredibly easy to digest, so when you go to a failure, you don't have to go anywhere. That's, that's the perfect world. Maybe you have a builder, and you already know what the builder is doing, but the perfect world is you get there, the builder creates the domain object, and you look at what's actually being tested, the expected value as a literal, perfect, uh, you look at the, the method call or function call to the domain, and uh, it's, it's extremely clear what's going on. Ideally, you don't want to rely on any type of IDE to have to read a test. That, that just feels wrong to me.